from Stratford Collaborative Impact Decatur, the Two Georgias Initiative, and the Just Health Circle. The purpose of the webinar series is to listen, to learn, and increase health equity awareness and shift health equity perspective towards action. The partnership of Southern Equity advances policy and institutional actions that promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all, for, for all in the growth of metropolitan Atlanta and the American South. The four areas they advance are just health, just energy, just growth, and just opportunity. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, someone who I consider a role model, Dr. Kamara Jones, is a family physician and epidemiologist whose work focuses on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on the health and well being of the nation. She is the past president of American Public Health Association and was the 2019 2020 Evelyn Green Davis Fellow at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She has taught at Harvard School of Public Health, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Rollins School of Public Health, and served as a medical officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Her allegories on race and racism illuminate topics that are otherwise difficult for many Americans to understand or discuss, recognizing that racism saps the strength of the whole society through waste of human resources. She aims to mobilize and engage all Americans in the national campaign against racism. I now present Dr. Kamara Jones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brittany. And I'm delighted to be part of this webinar series. Again, it's a very important series. And I actually, um, in June, helped to launch uh, the series. And we ran out of time. So we're going to connect um, the conversation and move forward. I'm going to share my screen and share some slides. And I also want to say that what we're going to do is a conversation. So yes, I have slides, but um, during the presentation, we'll take planned breaks for discussion and questions. And if you have an urgent, <laughs> an urgent question that you need to be addressed right now, please put it in the Q&A box. Uh, Brittany will just interrupt me and say, well, Dr. Jones, we can't wait until that planned uh, break. You know, can you please answer this question now? Because we really need to have spaces where we can just talk to one another and not just kind of listen to stuff coming at us. So the urgency of removing barriers to achieve health equity, here we go. The key messages that all of us need to convey to everybody around us, especially in this time, are four. The first is that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that we can act to dismantle racism. So those are our four key messages. And what I'm going to do is give you some tools to effectively convey those messages and we'll go deeper into other things as well. Now, if you were with us in June, you may have seen this story before. Uh, it is the story that I tell to convey that racism exists if I only have four minutes with the group. I call this allegory, dual reality, a restaurant saga. And like almost all of my allegories, it's been sparked by something that I saw in my own real life. So let me tell you the story of when I was a first year medical student. Of course, as a first year medical student, I was very diligent, very studious. So I wake up one Saturday morning and I'm hitting the books, studying. And it gets to be about midday and some friends come over. And do we go out for a walk or do something else? No, no, we all get to studying long and hard. And now it's getting late and we're getting hungry. And I have no food in the apartment, which was quite typical of me. My friends understood. They were like, never mind, Kamara, but let's go into town and find something to eat. 
So we do. We walk into town and we find a restaurant and we walk in and we sit down and the menus are presented and we order our food and the food is served and here we are eating. So not a very illuminating story about racism, not yet. But as I sat there with my friends eating, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign and that sign was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now I've intrigued you perhaps and you're wondering, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost some of you. So let me just recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating I look across the room, I see a sign that says open. If I hadn't thought another thing about it, I would have assumed that other hungry people could just walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that indeed the restaurant was now closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of the sign would not be able to sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I recognize that racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it's difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. In fact, it's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. But those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims close to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant, for those who are asking, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, what? You could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all, inside with you. And you could say, restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door? Let them come in. You will make more money and oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass food through the window, or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or even break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So this story is to convey in a vivid way where people can really understand because they've seen these signs before, that yes, racism is structuring two-sided or multi-sided signs in our society. It's creating a dual or multifaceted reality. And of course, racism is not just the sign, it's the sign, it's the door, it's the lock, it's all of that. I actually started a three hour conversation once with this question, how could people who are born inside the restaurant know something about the two sided nature of that sign. And actually, there are many ways to know that's why it was a three hour conversation. I have to say that now I am heartened that there are more and more people who were born inside the restaurant with some understanding that there's a two sided sign going on, maybe even today after the lack of any um, indictment of any of the police officers involved in the killing of Breonna Taylor. Last night lets us know there's something differential going on here by race, right? That the justice system is not working the same by race. But so more and more people with the murder of George Floyd, with, with all of these, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, more and more people who are inside the restaurant have gotten a glimpse. Maybe the air conditioning went on high and made the sign flip. Or maybe, maybe a brick came through the window and made the sign flutter for a bit. And it is important. It is important for people inside the restaurant to understand that, yes, 
Black Lives Matter. You know, before they might have said, well, what are those people outside saying? Black Lives Matter, don't they know all lives matter? Well, now maybe there's a deeper understanding. It's important to affirm that Black Lives Matter. People are more likely now to say the word racism and even to put structural racism or systemic racism to say a whole phrase. My warning, as heartened as I am by that, my warning is that our nation's baseline stance of racism denial is so seductive that if we just say a thing, then six months from now, we may forget why we said that thing, systemic racism, structural racism, Black Lives Matter. We may forget why we said it because we may have fallen back into what I describe as the somnolence of racism denial. So we must go beyond just saying a thing to doing a thing. We need to be about tearing down the sign, dismantling the lock, taking the door off the hinges. Because if we start acting, then we won't forget why we're acting. So, again, for those who have heard me speak before, this first part is just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, there's going to be lots of new stuff, but um, maybe some of you have heard my definition of racism before. If so, I hope that you maybe can recite it with me. But let me just share for all of us. When I say the word racism, I am clear that I'm talking about a system. That's, so I'm not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested, although it can manifest in those ways. But in its essence, racism is a system of power and a system of doing what? It's a system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured? And on what basis is the value assigned? It's based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks in this race conscious society, which is what we call race. And what are the impacts of this system? Well, when we do think or talk about racism at all, we understand that racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. That's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in this country because it makes some people, especially some white people, uncomfortable. And um, for years, when I would do a talk like this and share my definition, at this point I might say, and if you feel a little uncomfortable, I want you to shake it off, stay with me, I'll tell you some more stories. I don't say that anymore. In fact, I make the point I'm making now that if you feel uncomfortable, I encourage you to lean into that discomfort because I have come to recognize that for all of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But the third impact of racism is sometimes missed by many, many people. And that is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And I might add, through the way that it divides us and pits us against one another. So, you know, yes, Black lives matter. But it's not just that Black lives matter. Black lives are precious. Black lives are genius. Black lives are leadership and creativity and generosity and love. And when we constrain Black lives and Indigenous lives and Latinx lives and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander lives and Asian lives and all of these racialized lives, when we constrain these lives either slowly by not vigorously investing in the full excellent public education of all of our kids because the blinders of racism have made some folks think there's no genius in the barrios or the ghettos or the reservations we can get along very well thank you without those kids or if we constrain these black indigenous and other people of color lives slowly by being complacent with the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that didn't result in the loss of human potential, or if we snuff them out quickly with a police officer's bullet or a police officer's knee, it is not just that that genius and life and potential has been lost or that family has been crushed in its soul. It is that we are sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Before I leave this slide, I just have one more thing to say. You know, when I talked about 
you know, how racism unfairly disadvantages some and unfairly advantages others. I recognize that there are many people in our country who think that there are two states of being, yes, but that the two states of being are disadvantaged and normal. And the reason that we think that there are these two states of being disadvantaged and normal is that we as a nation are ahistorical. And people do not understand that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. I will go into that much more deeply in just a minute. I am not going to retell my levels of racism theoretic framework in Gartner's tale. Um, I'm not going to go there. If you are not familiar with the Gartner's tale, the reason I'm not going to do that is because it takes me about 20 minutes. It is the bedrock of my work, but many of you who are on this webinar would have, are familiar with the Gartner's Tale, which describes three levels of racism, institutionalized or structural, personally mediated and internalized, where the story illustrates that we must address the, at least address the structural racism if we want to set things right in our society. And when we address the structural racism, the other levels may take care of themselves. Um, I encourage you, if you are not familiar with this story, it's, there's a four-page paper that I have the reference there. There's an 18-minute interview in which I describe the three levels of racism and, uh, and then illustrate it with the Gartner's tale. But I do want to just share what I use as the last slide when I tell that story, which is who is the Gartner? Because after all, the Gartner, who has these flower bots, boxes, one with rich fertile soil and one with, with poor rocky soil and seed for the same kind of flowers, ex except some produces pink blossoms and some produces red blossoms and the gardener prefers red over pink and puts the red seed in the rich fertile soil and the pink seed in the poor rocky soil. Who is the gardener? The gardener is the one who has the power to decide, the power to act and control of resources. And in our setting, clearly government is a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part because media, foundations, corporations, even communities to the extent that they have self-determination can be part of the Gartner. But it is dangerous when the Gartner is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. And so our challenge is what to do about the gardener, do make the gardener strive, polka dotted or fuchsia, do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? Lots of questions that can come out of it. And very quickly, two questions that I wanted to raise now, which will make immense sense if you have heard the story before, but hopefully a little bit of sense, even as I've outlined the story. The first question that I was asked very early on as I was telling this, this story, I've been telling it for now more than 25 years. But early on, somebody asked me, excuse me, Dr. Jones, why should the red flowers share their soil? And I, was, I loved hearing that question. First of all, because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism that might be otherwise difficult if we we're talking about racism between you and me. But my answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil, is that actually that soil does not belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. And the second question that I like to raise is what if that's not the original gardener we're looking at right there? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Because here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think there's a problem to be solved. So very quickly in three steps, the first step is for us to make the differences between the height and bigger of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. We have to put it on the agenda. And actually, even before that, the step zero is for us to understand that the pink and red seed are seed for the same kind of flowers, that there is no biologically determined difference in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers, right? So we have to fight against all of these notions of biological determinism by race that are still extant in our society. But after we put this on the agenda, the second step is, well, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna solve the problem? Which, means that we must make the flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil. But then the third step is as we make those flower boxes transparent, we have to be crystal clear to convey that, you know, so that everybody knows that the pink seed did not just launch themselves into the poor rocky soil. So we need to talk about history and we need to talk about how the Gartner's initial preference for red over pink 
the preference that set up the whole situation, which many people describe as cultural racism, which in our society is white supremacist ideology. We must not only acknowledge that it exists, but we must address that. Because if we do not, even if we are able to compel the red gardener to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So that brings us to our first polling question. And Brittany, if you can introduce the polling question um, and uh, Kia, if you can launch the poll or Andrea, if you can launch the poll. Sure, our first poll question is, if you had to choose between which to address first, opportunity structures or a differential value assignment, which would you address first? Opportunity structures, value assignment. And I'm and the, and the, background, the background of that is that I have defined racism as a system that both structures opportunity and assigns value. And while they're um, answering that question, Dr. Jones, we have a question from the audience. What definition do we assign to treatment that appears to be racism, but is coming from someone that looks like you? Uh, internalized racism. So um, I did not go into the different levels, but let me take this opportunity to define the three levels of racism. So institutionalized or structural racism is the system, if you will. It's the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, which taken together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator. It uh, often shows up as inherited disadvantage or as reciprocal inherited advantage. And we see it in terms of conditions, differential um, you know, material conditions and access to power. Um, I, we're gonna look at the poll results, but I want to carry on to answer this question. The second level of racism is, um, in personally mediated racism, which um, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. And the third level of racism, internalized racism, is acceptance by members of stigmatized races of the negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth with, which have been communicated to us by the society's acceptance of the limitations of the box into which we've been placed. So very often when you see people of color differentially treating other people of color, it is as if they have uh, accepted lock, stock and barrel the differential um, assumptions about our abilities, motives and intents that have been communicated through the broader society. So it is internalized racism. Okay, if you can put back up the polling results. Thank you. So this is very, very interesting to me. This is very interesting to me. It is about split. And I don't have the, the answer for this. You know what I'm saying? If I, if I were pressed, this is how I've been thinking about it recently. If I were pressed, I would address the opportunity structures first and interrupt the transmission of values. And, and the example I give you of this is, you know, there are gas stations that my parents, you know, say in Tennessee or, you know, Alabama or Mississippi, where my parents, when, we, when I was a little kid, would not be able to go in and get gas at a certain gas station. Now that the laws have changed, those same gas station owners might still be owning it, but now they have to sell us some gas. And so sometimes if you change the structures, then opportunities will become available even though the attitudes haven't changed. But the problem is the attitudes continue to be passed down generation to generation. So we need to find a way to interrupt that transmission of the values, right? Um, so that the people who are holding the negative stuff will die out. And then we have a whole crop of new people who see the pink and red flowers equally beautiful because now you've enriched the, red, the poor rocky soil and so it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. They might even see the pink flowers looking a little bit better than the red because that seed has of course been selected for survival and strength. But I don't always say that because that makes some, some of the red flowers nervous. But so I think if we enrich the poor rocky soil, that has to be done because all the attitude changing in the world may not result in the changing of the soil because 
structural racism often shows up as lack of action, inaction in the face of need. So once you get the bad situ situation set up, even though the attitudes are different, there may no be, still not be any action. There may be inaction in the face of need. So if I were pressed, I would tip on the opportunity structures, but all the rest of what I'm gonna tell you today is about values and what the values that we need to address. So I am right with you. I am evenly split, even in my soul. But if I had to go one way or the other, I would go the way that our group did and just tip a little bit toward opportunity structures first. Of course, we need to address all of it at the same time. We have okay. another question, Dr. Jones, as well. So another question is, your flower metaphor sounds very familiar to Dr. David Don's Orchard allegory in his new political determinants of health book. Did he derive this allegory from yours? I find yours to be more accurate and wonder if he did, why altered his away from yours in the ways that he has? Um, so, so Daniel Dawes is a colleague of mine and a friend. I was surprised to see his orchard um, without a direct uh, reference to me. You know, of course, I published my, my Gardner's Tale allegory in 2000, and I've been telling it since the very early 90s for almost 30 years. And um, so I don't know. I never have had the opportunity yet to ask Daniel about that. But you're not the first person to ask me about that. Um, another colleague, upon reading the book immediately reached out to me. Um, so I don't know, it's, you know, good ideas go around um, and it's good for all of us to understand. But I do, you know, what I do find is that I so easily put my stuff out in the public domain and my ideas sometimes make so much sense that people forget where they heard them. You know, I, I've heard other people saying things because I'm, I'm an excellent teacher. And sometimes I make things so clear that then I'll hear my same words without attribution um, because people forgot where they heard it. Anyway, thank you for that question. Any others? I don't have any other questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, oh, so what I need to do, it seems like now that we're here, it doesn't want to start. So I'm going to stop sharing and start again from this point. This is sometimes a Zoom thing. Like if you just stay too long, then they're like, nah, <laughs> you're not going anywhere. So let me go back to that slide and then carry on. So, so now I'm going to um, frame the rest of my comments in the context of the national campaign against racism that I launched the American Public Health Association on way back in 2016 when I was president of the American Public Health Association. Um, and this campaign has three tasks. The first is to name racism. And I've already given you some tools for doing that. You know, I gave you the open close sign, which conveys that racism exists. That was one of the four key messages that we need to do. I gave you a definition of racism as a system. So that's the second of the four key messages that we have to get out, that racism is a system. The third of the key messages is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. So I, although I didn't give you a story to illustrate that, um, Maybe we're seeing it right now with regard to COVID-19 and the pandemic, which doesn't restrict itself to any communities, even though it might start in a community that is more exposed and less protected and, has, and is more burdened by chronic diseases with less access to healthcare. Um, that virus only has one job, which is to reproduce itself. And so, you know, so you can't put it there. So maybe we've done that. But then the fourth of the key messages is that we can act to dismantle racism. So beyond racism, naming racism is a very important thing, but the second question is to ask the question, how is racism operating here? To identify levers for action, targets for action, levers for intervention, and then to organize and strategize to act. And I am heartened that there are, the last time I looked, which was now about a week and a half ago, there were 990 jurisdictions in the US, including four states, 25 counties and 61 cities that 
have passed formal declarations of racism as a public health crisis or racism as a public health emergency. In Georgia, um, the county of DeKalb, DeKalb County, has such a proclamation. I haven't looked to see if that has spread more because the last time I looked was a week and a half ago. But this is important. And what's important about these is that these jurisdictions, it's not the city health department or the county health department that's doing it, it's the city council or the county board of commissioners or the state legislature, the you know, Minnesota House or you know, the whole state of, of uh, Wisconsin. You know, so these kinds of things. It's putting a stake in the sand. It's saying we are naming racism and public, please hold us accountable to take some action because we're recognizing it's a public health crisis. Of course, they could have said it's a housing crisis. It's a you know, criminal justice system crisis. It's an educational crisis. It's many crises. But I actually have been told that the first county to make this declaration, Milwaukee County, took the declaration from the Wisconsin Public Health Association, which passed their declaration in response to my national campaign against racism. So all these other cities and counties may not know from Kamara Jones, but I take, but it's, it's a, a snowball and I do take some pride in that and that people are framing it as a public health crisis because it is of course in our bodies individually and as a collective where we see all the impacts of housing and education and transportation, immigration, uh, injustice and all turning into, I mean, we are, the, we are the crucibles in which all of these things have their impacts. But as I said, we need to go beyond the naming, even the important naming by these 90 jurisdictions to ask the question, how is racism operating here, which is a legitimate question because racism is not a cloud or a miasma or, you know, some soup that we're going through, but it is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms which are in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, which are actually different elements of decision-making, where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, especially who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. And if structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, policies are the written how of decision-making, practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision-making, and values are the why. So, I, when I spoke in June, and if you weren't there, you can, I'm sure you can get that tape, I actually applied that question, how is racism operating here, to police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women, to identify levers for intervention there. I applied it to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, how is racism operating there, so you can go and look that up. I want to turn now to the very new part that I was not able to I ran out of time. We ran out of time because we had excellent discussion and the like. We ran out of time. So this is where I ended the June presentation. So all of this, I think, will be new. So I used to talk about societal barriers, cultural barriers to achieving health equity. I have now reframed that to be talking about values targets for anti-racism action. It's going to be the seven same seven things but I used to describe them in one way as barriers. And now, you know, there's an urgency in removing barriers. So now the reframe is that these are the values targets for anti-racism action. You'll see the reference at the bottom. I just published these um, three weeks ago, a little more than three weeks ago as part of the Harvard Primary Care blog, calling it Seeing the Water, because this is the water through which we as fish are swimming and we do not understand the profound impacts that these societal things have. The first three and the last that I'm going to list are why it's so easy for us to slip back into racism denial. The middle three are why it is hard for us to, um, why it's hard for us to make movement on, on health equity. So the first of these values targets is our narrow focus on the individual in this country which makes systems and structures either invisible or seemingly irrelevant. It 
constrains our self-interest to be very narrowly defined. We're not even worried about our aunts and uncles and cousins and the like, much less those people across town. We have a limited sense of interdependence there, but for the grace of God go I, we're all in this together. And even our sense of our power is limited because we ask ourselves, what can I do about racism or any of these other systems of structured inequity, as opposed to what can we do? We do not have a sense of collective efficacy. The second of these seven values targets is the fact that we in this nation are ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. And you know what happens when you're ahistorical? You're born, you see things a certain way, you think they, they've always been that way and they always have to stay that way. So it even gives you a limited sense of how changeable systems and structures are. We need to study the history of successful progressive change in this country right now to understand at this point where we are in our nation's possibility, history and possibility, what has worked and what hasn't, right? The third of these Values targets is our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy. The story that goes something like this. If you work hard, you will make it. Now, I give you that most people who have worked hard, no, no, ha, I was about to say it wrong, woo, woo, erase. Most people who have made it have worked hard. Although not everybody who's made it has worked hard. We have you know, some prominent examples of that. But even as we understand that most people who have made it have worked hard, there are many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field that has been structured and is being maintained by racism, sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, all of these systems of structured inequity. And to the extent that we deny the existence of those systems, we are endorsing the myth of meritocracy and blaming those people who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid and there are many ways to deny racism. You can say, I don't think racism exists, which many people in our government are saying right now. Or you could just never say the word racism. I mean, you could be working on disparities or disproportionalities or cultural competence, structural competence, implicit or unconscious bias, as well as explicit or conscious bias, diversity, equity, inclusion, race. If you could talk about all those things but never say the word racism, then you are complicit with the racism denial in this nation, right? We've got to put the ism part out. That's the system part. So these three things are very much why racism denial is so seductive in our nation, but there's more. So the myth of a zero sum game, if you gain, I lose, which puts us up in competition as opposed to cooperation with one another. It masks the cost of inequity that racism and these other systems of structured inequity actually sap the strength of the whole society. And it hinders efforts to grow the pie. And in fact, I liken it now as I'm at a potluck dinner and I don't want so-and-so to come to this table because I think they're just gonna come and eat all the food and I don't even recognize that they're bringing with them all kinds of cakes and pies and roasts and salads and fruits and all kinds of good things because I don't even value them. The fifth of these seven values targets is our limited future orientation. So the way that we can touch the future right now is by touching the children or the planet. And we in this nation have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. We do not, for example, have the seven generations hence view when we make our decisions that many American Indian nations have. And we do not have a concern, how are the children uh, that many, I'm told that Maasai people and other East African people greet each other, not, hey, how are you doing? But how are the children hoping to get back the answer, all the children are well. We don't even ask how are the children in this country. And if we did, we certainly would not get the answer that all the children are well. The sixth of these seven values targets for anti-racism action is our endorsement of the myth of American exceptionalism, that we in the United States are so unique, so different, so God ordained, if you will, that the usual rules shouldn't apply to us and that there's nothing that we can learn from anybody else, no other country. And oh, if we would only learn from the countries that are dealing so much better with COVID-19 than we are. The seventh of these values targets is actually the first. 
white supremacist ideology, which is not a lightning rod term. It is a simple description of a false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race with the falser notion that even if there were such a hierarchy, which there is not, that puts white people as the at the top as the ideal or the norm. This false idea gives people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It results in dehumanization of people of color and fear at the browning of America, a fear that underlies a lot of our divided politics today. So we are going to shift now to polling questions two first and then three. So the first question is, which one of the seven values targets for anti-racism action should society address first? And while you guys are answering that question, Dr. Jones, I have a question from the audience. Yes. What career opportunities, functions, or organizations to pursue to become involved in the national campaign against racism or to work to address racism in public health? Well, great. Okay, so... <laughs> So, you know, so since that 2016 campaign, um, there's, um, so Dr. Michelle Morse, when she was a Soros Equality Fellow from the Social Medicine Consortium and Equal Health actually established a network of global chapters of a campaign against racism. And so um, the last I absolutely knew, there were 23 chapters in nine countries. I think there are five new chapters, which would make 25 28 chapters in 14 countries. Certainly uh, in Atlanta, there's a chapter of this campaign against racism that is based at the Morehouse School of Medicine. But um, you can get in touch with me and I can give you more information. Or if you just, uh, if you just go to social medicine, Google social medicine, it might be socialmedicineconsortium.org or something, but Google social medicine campaign against racism, you can find more information there. The, Dr. Chandra Ford with her center on the study of racism, social justice and health has put a holding place for my national campaign against racism, anti-racism collaborative that I'm about to describe to you guys in a minute there. So that's framework at UCLA. But I am in active discussion and partnership now with Allison Bantemba and others at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which might, we might be housing what I'm about to describe to you an anti-racism collaborative with eight collective action teams right there at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. So I am so excited that you asked about this. Um, of course, there are other people who've taken different pieces and, and bits of it. Um, but after we talk about that, then I would love for you guys to, to get engaged. Thank you for that question. Another question, can, some, can you please share the YouTube information again? Thanks. And we do not have that um, link yet, so we will get back with you on that, whoever asked, asked that question. Which, which uh, information? The YouTube information, Andrea informed me that we do not have that information yet. For, for the YouTube on my gardener's tale? Is that the one somebody answered? Well, okay, so it's easy to find. Um, if you Google Kamara Jones gardener's tale or Kamara Jones, yes, that'll get you to that one. If you Google Kamara Jones, Ted, talk, then that will get you to um, a talk I did with four allegories. So, um, but yeah, so you guys can find that again. It was actually on my slide. And when I go back, um, uh, well, let's have, let's see the results of poll question two. And then we'll go to poll question three. Wow. Okay. So which one of the seven values targets for anti-racism action should society address first? Uh, the winner is white supremacist ideology of 51%, followed by a historical stance, amen, followed by a tie between narrow focus on the individual and a myth of a zero sum game, followed by the myth of American exceptionalism, uh, followed by the myth of meritocracy with only a few unlimited future orientation. Interesting. Thank you all for that input. This is the first time I've asked this question. So, Polling question three, you're gonna be like, oh, didn't she just ask that? But here, look at polling question three, it's slightly different. Polling question three, which one of the seven values targets for anti-racism action are you 
best position to address first. I'm gonna go over there. So the difference here is which should society address first, but then now in our personal wheelhouse, our personal networks and all, which one are you best positioned to address first? And if there are any other questions that are coming up while we're waiting for that poll to close. So this is very interesting. So the answer is 46% say they're um, best position to, position to address the narrow focus on the individual, followed by white supremacist ideology, a historical stance, a tie between myth of meritocracy and myth of American exceptionalism, followed by myth of zero-sum game and limited future orientation. Um, very interesting. I would love to hear then um, how, uh, this will be a great point for discussion. So, so I'm going to raise this at the very end of the talk. I don't want to slow us down, but for one person from who voted for each of those things, just one person to put in the Q and A, or, or maybe just when we open it up for discussion in some other kind of way, how are you positioned? to address that thing that you picked. So you might say, I picked uh, limited future orientation and this is how I'm positioned to do it. I think that's really good. So I am going to, are there any other questions, Brittany? Brittany, did we lose Brittany? I think Brittany has some kind of way left us. Yeah, and there's somebody else who's on who has her name. <laughs> exactly. But I'm not showing uh, another question at the moment. Thank you, Andrea. So I actually have to stop sharing and get back in again because of that thing. Oh, hi, Brittany, you're back. My apologies, I'm not sure what happened. Yay. Are there any other questions that we should deal with right now? Yes. Okay. I am to get back to the questions. Considering the current training bans taken by the current administration, Americans should be taught to be proud of this country. And if you don't, there is nothing you don't, there's nothing for you. What can public professionals do to move past these actions? Well, there's a difference. Of course, we should be proud of the country, but we should also know its history. What we're proud of is not the history. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Hold we on. can hear both of you. Okay. So I heard the question to be, given the training bans, um, shouldn't Americans be proud of their history? Was it, finish it in case I missed something, in case I started talking before you finished, Brittany. Now I can't hear you. Sure, sure, sure. Considering the current no, you're really breaking up. Can you hear me? Up. It's breaking up. So I'll answer what I think the question was. Um, that given the training bans, there's, there are people who are feeling that, uh, that we should be proud of the U.S. And if you're not proud, then there's nothing here for you. And I think that we should be proud of um, the potential of this country. We should know the full history of the country because without understanding our full history, we are hamstrung. In fact, uh, three principles for achieving health equity are valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. And so if you don't know the history, then you can't recognize and certainly not rectify historical injustices and providing resources according to need. 
So I think that there is pride in that we are on a journey as this nation, but we have to understand all of the obstacles that we um, have come over. We need to understand all of the baggage that we're still carrying. And we need to be clear eyed in looking at ourselves to understand how we can go forward for the good of all of us. And so I think that some of this uh, notion of we shouldn't know the history is devaluing the experience of some of us over others. Or people who saying, who, who, who challenge, for example, the 1619 project. I mean, that's just, that's like what happened. We should all know about that. You will remember that of the seven values targets for achieving health equity or the seven values targets for anti-racism action is the fact that we have this ahistorical stance. We think you can just start from today. You know, that the present is disconnected from the past and that the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage is just a happenstance. It's almost as if there are two, there's a hill and there's somebody coasting down on a bicycle and somebody just mm, working hard and then they get to a point on the hill where there's a race that's gonna start. If you just start at that track without taking into account the history, you will be, you will misinterpret what's, what happens with that race. So we have to understand history. Any other questions? There was one more, Dr. Jones. Um, someone is asking, do ideologies such as the womanist movement empower black people, specifically black women, or segregate, or segregate us from whites, specifically white women? So there the distinction is being made between the feminist movement, which did not uh, bring in black women, and the womanist movement, which then took a stance um, as black women. It's similar to the American Medical Association not accepting black doctors and not and and, and you know saying that um, and if you weren't a member of the American Medical Association, then you you know couldn't be part of the state medical association. Therefore, you couldn't have privileges. And so they had the American Medical Association kind of you know, doing things and then the creation of the National Medical Association or the American Bar Association, not taking black lawyers. So then you had the creation of the National Bar Association. So it, in many ways, these things are not separating uh, people, but are an acknowledgement of the separation and a fulfillment of the need of people to express themselves, organize, to be in solidarity, to be a collective. So no, I don't think so. I think that, that everybody, you know, now that there you know, is the, the feminist movement and the womanist movement, of course, all of these people should get to know each other and be with each other and stuff like that and learn from one another. Um, the history is what it is. That's why a womanist movement evolved because, because black women weren't being acknowledged and their contributions and their brilliance and all what were really, and their concerns were not being acknowledged within the feminist movement, if I understand my history correctly. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. Jones, for that. I do not have any questions in the Q&A box, and I'm so sorry for disconnecting earlier. There's a horrible storm going on in Sioux that is affecting my internet, so my apologies for the disruption. Okay, thank you for being there. So now, <laughs> I'm, so now I'm going to carry on. And before, just before I share with you this framework for an anti-racism collaborative, I wanted to you know, if I saw you in front of me, all of you, then I'd have you raise your hands or whatever. But just, I'm gonna ask rhetorically, knowing that you may not be able to answer, how many of you have heard of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination? When I have asked this question in the past, people are like, no, what is it? Actually, I might have should have had that as a polling question. Just simply, have you heard of it, yes or no? But what it is, is an international anti-racism treaty that was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly way back in 1965. Who knew that there was an international anti-racism treaty? So then the further question that I ask people is, do you think the US has signed this treaty? Like that's a for real question. And most people are like, no, but the answer is yes. The US signed the treaty in 1966, but there's a little hook on that. Our diplomats can go and sign any treaty that they want but it has no impact on the nation until the Senate ratifies the treaty. 
So here's another follow up question. Do you think the US Senate has ratified this treaty? So now you guys are like, mm, really don't know. Well, the answer is yes. 28 years later in 1994. But yes, the US Senate ratified this treaty, which means that today we have treaty obligations to do right under this treaty. One of the obligations is to submit periodic reports. The reports in the treaty were, were designed to be every two years, but we and other nations are allowed to bundle our reports into six year reports. The last report that we submitted, and these reports are written by the State Department, the US State Department, so it's not even like some academic somewhere, but the US State Department writes these reports. The last report was submitted to the UN committee that takes these reports from all of the different countries on a staggered schedule in 2013. So you can read that report. And you can also read the 82 parallel or shadow or you know, alternative reports that were submitted by civil society organizations. In fact, anybody, any individual or organization or group can submit a parallel report. And the UN committee considers all of these reports together. So our last report was considered in 2014. And in response to our report, this committee sent back its concluding observations, which we received in 2014. It's a 14 page document. So it's not, so the treaty is just nine pages. These concluding observations are 14 pages. I think our, our third report was maybe 69 pages. So it's more to read, but you certainly could read this 14 page concluding observations today. And it starts out, dear United States, thank you for your report. We remain concerned about racial profiling or residential segregation or the achievement gap in education or differential access to healthcare or disproportionate incarceration and on and on and on. And not only does the committee remain concerned, they have specific recommendations for those things. That's where those paragraph references are. But also the committee recommends that the US, the state party, increase its efforts to let people in this country know about the existence of this treaty and that the US adopt a national action plan to combat structural racial discrimination. So here's a possible plan. This is the anti-racism collaborative with eight collective action teams that I first, um, and here are the names of the eight collective action teams that I first I'll give you the history. This was first um, sparked by the seven standing committees of the Racism and Health Work Group at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which then I kind of elaborated on while at, during my year as APHA president, but we did not have the social networking platform to support uh, robust work in these eight collective action teams. So we didn't launch it then. And as I said, uh, Dr. Chandra Ford at UCLA and Dr. Michelle Morris in the Global Campaign Against Racism have taken different pieces of it. What I'm going to do right now is for each of these eight collective action teams, share some guiding questions and early ideas for action. So for the communication and dissemination collective action team guiding questions include how can we support the naming of racism in all public and private spaces and what tools and strategies are needed to start community conversations on racism. Early ideas include developing a communication toolbox with allegories, billboards, films, podcasts, songs, tweets, webinars, whatever you can develop to support conversations on racism and to put racism and anti-racism on community agendas anti-racism chats, perhaps in workplaces, civic dinners, which different cities have engaged in, town hall meetings. In fact, the Kellogg Foundation um, actually had a network of 30, I believe, truth, racial healing and transformation uh, groups uh, that are still persisting in, in communities across the country. The second of these eight collective action teams, education and development, Guiding questions include how can we support training around issues of race, racism and anti-racism at educational institutions of all levels, and what does effective anti-racism curriculum even look like? So early ideas include convening anti-racism scholars and activists to develop a base core curriculum, to develop curricula for schools of public health, medicine, social work, law, develop curricula for K-12 education, and even um, I'm planning to publish my allegories as a series of children's books to enable parents and librarians and teachers to 
to start conversations that are often not had in white families. And so then white children grow up to be white adults and they say, well, how could racism be a problem? My parents never talked to me about it. Well, this is to help people provide a tool for that. With regard to the third uh, collective action team, Global Matters, how can we use ICERD, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination to support anti-racism work in the United States? And what can we learn from anti-racism work in other nations? So early ideas for action include in informing the US public about US obligations under this international anti-racism treaty and to examine anti-racism efforts in other countries. Also participating in global conversations on social justice because in some countries, it might not be framed as racism, it might be colonialism or imperialism or religious divisions or the like, but to participate in global conversations on social justice writ large. Because that same definition that I gave you of racism can be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. For example, what is sexism? That's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And there are many axes of inequity operating in our society today, intersecting in communities and in individuals. Um, and all of these axes of inequity have their associated systems of structured inequity. So they include gender, religion, uh, rural, urban, you know, immigration status, uh, weight status. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, ability status and the like, you know, um, uh, gender identity, all of that. So I recognize that all of those things are going on. And so then you might challenge me, really, you might say, well, Dr. Jones, why is your work so focused on race as the axis of inequity and racism as the system of structured inequity when you acknowledge all of this stuff is going on? And it is because racism is foundational in our nation's history. And yet many people today are in staunch denial of its continued existence and profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of the nation. So I encourage all of us to become at least actively anti-racist, even as we engage in these other struggles. And to the extent that we're able to dismantle the mechanisms of racism, the other struggles will benefit as well. I spoke a little longer on that than I had planned, but on to the next. So history, the fourth of these eight collective action teams, guiding questions include, what is the history of successful anti-racism struggle in the United States and around the world? And how can this history guide our anti-racism work today? And how can we institutionalize attention to history in all decision-making processes? Because if you're trying to solve a problem for a city or a state or the nation, and you're trying to untie a knot, it would behoove you to understand how that knot got tied. So early ideas for action include teaching our full history. So the 1619 project and textbooks, museums, school curricula, after school programs. Um, I understand there is now, a, and I haven't looked at the details of it, a 1776 project which seeks to nullify uh, the 1619 project. That is really um, unfortunate. Why would anyone want people not to know our full histories. But anyway, I'm not very familiar with the 1776 project, so I'm premature in discussing that. Um, we also, I suggest, should hire historians to staff city councils, state legislatures, the US Congress, and the like. As I said, like every decision-making body should have a historian to help research the background of a problem that is now trying to be solved. Liaison and partnership, where the guiding questions include what anti-racism work is happening at the community level, what anti-racism work is happening in other sectors from where you are. So, you know, I understand a lot of what's going on in the public health space, but what's happening in the education space or, you know, the housing space or the like. And how can we create linkages between this anti-racism work? where early ideas for action include cataloging and connecting local anti-racism efforts throughout the nation and around the world, and drafting an anti-racism commitment agreement for communities, businesses, and organizations across sectors. With regard to organizational excellence, how do we answer the question, how is racism operating here in each of our settings? This is a very important thing because I recommend that we take this question, how is racism operating here? with us everywhere. 
how is racism operating here in my community, in my workplace, in my child's school, et cetera, et cetera, with regard to limited exposure of children of color to nature, with regard to the limited enrollment of people of color in clinical trials, like how is racism operating here with regard to police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women or the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. So how do we examine these structures, policies, practices, norms and values, which are the elements of decision making? In order to get started, early ideas include examining. So I actually have distilled four classes of policies that are contributing to racism, that are mechanisms of structural racism. These policies include those policies that allow segregation of resources and risks, those policies that create inherited group disadvantage or its reciprocal inherited group advantage, those policies that favor the differential valuation of human life by race, including curriculum policies or policies to erase history, and those policies that limit self-determination, like some of the, um, some of the uh, policies now to disenfranchise whole populations, including, for example, what's happening in Florida where the people voted to allow uh, people with felony convictions once they had done all of their time and everything to be able to register to vote again. And then there's all of this stuff back and forth on that. With regard to policy and legislation, guiding questions include what are current policy and legislative strategies to address and dismantle racism? And what new strategies should we propose? So early ideas include cataloging formal anti-racism policies adopted by US jurisdictions. This slide, like now I need to include all 90 of those jurisdictions that declare racism to be a public health crisis along with, uh, with others who are looking at racism with regard to uh, prisons, racism with regard to foster care, racism with regard to housing, environmental justice and the like. And we, I would suggest need to develop and disseminate model legislation addressing the many mechanisms of structural racism in the same way that other organizations, for example, ALEC, have developed and disseminated model legislation to, uh, to, to do um, things that constrain the rights uh, and opportunities of some populations compared to others. With regard to science and publications, what research has been done to examine the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation and the world? What intervention strategies have been evaluated? Because so far, there are so many studies, thousands of stu studies now documenting the impacts of racism on health. But are we doing a natural experiment type of thing? I mean, are we almost like those uh, who participated, who planned the US Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male? which is sometimes misunderstood, mis called the Tuskegee syphilis study. But are we doing that just an observational study or why don't we try some penicillin? Like there are some interventions we can try. We can invest in schools, we can invest in communities, we can you know, do something. So what intervention strat strategies have been evaluated and what new measures and methods are needed? Early ideas for action include putting measures of racism on population-based surveys. So for 13 years between 2002 and 2014, um, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system had an optional uh, module called the reactions to race module, six question module. Those data still um, would have lots of stuff that can be mined. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey would be a good place, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and others. And we need to develop the science and practice of anti-racism. If we understood the, the, the science and practice of anti-racism is actually understanding not only the impacts of racism and what interventions we might try, but also anticipating the pushback that progress might meet. So here we are, time for polling questions four and five. Okay, which of the eight, which one of the eight collective action teams would you be most likely to join? And while the, you all are answering the questions, I do have one question from the audience, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. I, I have heard arguments saying that segregation was the worst thing that ever happened to black people as Blacks lose their cultures and assimilate. I don't believe this statement, but I am curious to know your thoughts. The segregation of resources and risks 
continues to be the worst thing. Well, that and the dehumanization. So there's the opportunity structure piece of it and the value assignment of it. So this is not a thing of the past. Uh, opportunity structures still segregate, are still segregated. So housing is very segregated by race in this country. And then educational institutions, especially the public schools, very segregated. And if you have a neighborhood that's been disinvested, because it's easy to disinvest in this segregated neighborhood if you don't care about those people, and the placement of environmental hazards and the like, poisoned and, and all of that. Well, if you have a poor neighborhood like that, then you and you're basing the funding of public schools based on local property taxes, then you're going to have poorly funded schools which often result in poor educational outcomes and another whole generation lost. And that, that setup is why people of color in this country are more likely to be infected with COVID-19 because we're more exposed and less protected, more exposed because we are in these frontline, low paid, essential jobs without the proper personal protective equipment, without the protection of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Oh my God, not only has CDC been muzzled in its messaging, but even in OSHA, which is part of CDC, in promulgating uh, requirements for workplaces. So I digress. But anyway, so, so the segregation of, of housing, which results in segregation of education, which results in segregation of occupation, segregation of clean air, clean water, and you know, the five cities in Michigan where they put in, um, oh, what do they call them now? The, the emergency managers, which then resulted, the emergency manager's decision that resulted in the poisoning of the Flint water supply. Those five, there were many cities that were in financial trouble, but the only five that had emergency managers were the five majority black cities in, in the state. So, so there's a lot of segregation going on. And so the segregation of resources, which still, the de jura part of it, the book, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein describes how the federal government actively participated through the FHA and VA system to continue to segregate and to refuse to allow the desegregation of communities in many, many uh, cities across our, our country. So there's this de jure, you know, by law thing, not just de facto, and it's certainly not just by choice, because people would like to have better resources. All people would like to. So, so there, so I, I've even gone off. I mean, the, you know, was that the worst thing? It still is. It's still a bad thing. But the other worst thing is the dehumanization of people of color that it would allow a white police officer to, with equanimity, hands in his pockets, shades on his head, put his knee on the neck of Mr. George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds, while Mr. Floyd begged for his life to just crush the life out of him. So that's, what do you do? You do that to a deer? I mean, I, I don't even know. Some people say that that's what people do to deer. Um, but the dehumanization of people of color. So, okay. I'm, I'm quiet on that. Do I think it's, I think that our situation is dire still. Can we see the results of polling question four? Okay, so which one of the eight collective action teams would you be most likely to join? So 27% said they would do education and development with the ones after that being policy and legislation at 17, communica communication and dissemination next, liaison and partnership after that, a tie between global matters and science and publications, history, and then the lowest organizational excellence. Although it's very interesting, it's very interesting. Thank you. This is such an interesting poll because actually, Organizational excellence, which is how do we look at structures? How do we look at policies? How do we look at practices, norms, and values? How do we take that question, how is racism operating here with us everywhere, is actually one that we could all do, right? But, um, but maybe we don't, maybe to develop those frameworks is still in the distance and people are like, well, I don't know how I would do that. So now polling question five is also gonna look familiar, but it's a different question. Which one of the eight collective action teams should be set up first? And while you guys are answering that question, I have another question for you, Dr. Jones. Okay, wait a second. I just want to make sure people understand. The first one was, which one would you join? The second is, should be set up first. So if there were limited resources, you, you know, everybody said, well, I would join this one. That's like in my wheelhouse. But 
but which one should be set up first? I have to, I'm going to answer this too. So hold on, don't ask a question. I have to think about which one. I'm going to answer it as well. <laughs> Okay, Brittany, I'm back. Okay. Yeah. So um, one of the questions from the audience, are you familiar with Richard Hughes' Miss America Lives By, White Supremacy and Other Stories That Gives Us Meaning? If so, can you consider it to be in relation to the seven values framework that you just presented? I'm not familiar with it. I didn't even catch the last name. Richard who? Richard Hughes. How do you spell it? H-U-G-H-E-S. Hughes. Hughes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hughes, I'm sorry. Okay, so Richard Hughes. So no, but um, I would be delighted to read it. And so Richard Hughes, and the title is? Miss America Live By, White Supremacy and Other Stories That Give Us Meaning. Okay, sounds like it's very related, in fact. So I should read it. But no, I, I've not um, heard of him or read his work yet. I will. Another question is, considering the current training bans taken by the current administration, in parentheses, Americans should be taught to be proud of this country, and if you don't, there's nothing for you. What can public professionals do to move past these actions? So I think we answered that question before, but you mean, so maybe they put it in because they say I didn't answer it. So given these bans, so what they're referring to, I believe, is uh, a memo from the Office of Management and Budget expressing the opinion that um, federal agencies should not invest in training on critical race theory. So I myself um, am too old, so I never studied critical race theory. So um, if you ask me, you know, I know that it involves naming racism and the like, um, but I don't, I know there are tenets too. I don't even know how many tenets there are, but honestly, I, just because of my age and that was like after me and it arose, I know in the legal profession, I'm not very familiar with critical race theory. However, um, if naming racism is part of critical race theory, I am all in because, <laughs> because that's what I do. So, but I think that this memo from the Office of Management and Budget was uh, saying that federal agencies should not spend um, their training budgets on that but it may have been interpreted to be wider now um, and that federal agencies should not be training on equity or diversity or anything. I mean, the interpretations, I think, uh, may be quite broad. So read the, read the second part of the question. So, th so that's acknowledging that I'm aware that there is a, uh, that there was a memo that was sent out by the Office of Management and Budget, Budget and signed by the head of that office, Richard Vaught, I think his name is. And so the second part. Yes, what can public professionals do to move past these actions? So what can public professionals move past, do to move past the actions of the stifling of conversation of issues of race and racism? That's how I'll take it. Um, well, these are important conversations. And so right now, I think the interpretation of that OMB memo um, is actually constraining some of these discussions in the federal place, but it doesn't constrain our discussions everywhere else. So we need to continue naming racism, asking the question, how is racism operating here and organizing and strategizing to act. It's actually even more urgent in these days. In these days when First Amendment rights can be constrained in that way. Thank you. And that is all the questions that I have in the Q&A box at this time. So let's see the results from poll question five. So the first question was like, what would you do? The second one is, which one should be set up first? Ah, policy and legislation. Okay. So policy and legislation. Then there was a tie between communication and dissemination and education and development. Then organizational excellence. Then liaison and partnership. Then history. Then science and publications. Teeny tiny and nobody for global matters first. Interesting. Thank you all for that. So um, I will see if I can just keep going. No, it got stuck. So I'm going to have to stop my share and then I'm going to start sharing again. And we're just coming around toward the end and then we'll have uh, lots of time for, for more full conversation.
have one more question if you if you don't mind me asking that while you're pulling it up um i don't mind at all hold on though let me just get myself in a place so it doesn't feel like so stuck okay yep okay how can we empower people to name racism when someone does does something racist it's difficult to say that was racist should we talk to should we talk around the term racism uh, we definitely should not talk around the term racism, but this is the importance when I gave the four key messages, I'm going to say them first, and then I'm going to hone in on message two. So the four key messages are that racism exists, that racism is a system, that racism saps the strength of the whole society, and that we can act to dismantle racism. That second one, that racism is a system, is a very important thing because Many times when we say the word racism, people think that you just call them racist or that you're trying to divide the room into who's racist or not, or you're trying to look at them and say exactly how racist are you. Like, like it turns people, especially people who are living as white in this country, uh, it, it, it makes many people nervous. So we have to be clear that when we say the word racism, we're talking about a system. So actually, this is gonna give me the opportunity to share um, a new allegory that I haven't fully illustrated yet but I'm going to call this one cement dust in our lungs. And this, the, the, the importance of the, the message of this, the moral of this allegory is that racism is a system. So imagine that there's a cement factory spewing cement dust into the air constantly. And if you're anywhere around that cement factory for any amount of time, you're going to have cement dust in your lungs. And the cement dust in our lungs is going to be problematic for us. Um, it might cause different problems in different people. So the cement dust in my lungs might cause me to doubt myself and feel like maybe I'm less than and maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to college or apply for that job or live in that neighborhood. Whereas the cement dust in somebody else's lungs might make him feel like he could just lean his knee on somebody's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. But the, but the cement dust is going to be problematic for all of us. So what is going to be our approach to solving this problem? Well, some people might think, well, maybe we need a machine to scan people and see how much cement dust there is in their lungs. But I don't think that's a, because what are you going to do? The people with too much cement dust, you're going to vote them off the island and put them in jail? So I, I don't think that that's the answer. So somebody said, oh, oh no, the kind of machine we need really is a machine that's going to extract cement dust from people's lungs. So, so that sounds like a good idea. Although that, those machines are going to need a whole lot of them, right? And they're going to have to be working 24-7 and, and, and the cement dust still keeps flying, right? But as long as we focus on the cement dust in our lungs, we're going to just be doing, you know, anti-racism trainings and all. And, and the moment we stop, the thing starts again. So maybe that's not the full answer. Well, as I've been thinking about it, I think the first part of the answer is to recognize that the problem, the big problem is not the cement dust in our lungs, but the fact that there's a cement factory spewing cement dust. So at the moment that I understand that this factory, that this structural racism exists, what can I do in the first moment? I can grab a gas mask if I don't want any more cement dust in my lungs. So I'm going to put on a gas mask to prevent more cement dust from coming in my lungs. It's my start of my journey as an individual to become actively anti-racist, recognizing that the gas mask is not gonna draw the cement dust that's already in my lungs out, I know that. But now as I'm wearing this gas mask, first of all, every time I see my reflection in a window or in a mirror, it's gonna remind me that the system exists. But also you all are gonna start asking me, Dr. Jones, why are you wearing a gas mask? Which is my opportunity to say, there is a cement factory spewing cement dust. Do you want more dust in your lungs? So people will be like, oh, no, no. So now more and more people will put on gas masks. But is that the answer? Do we just have a lot of people wearing gas masks? Do we have to keep making more and more gas masks and make little baby gas masks and old people gas masks and not? No. The answer is when there are enough of us with the gas masks, we can venture close to the factory, examine how is this factory operating here, and then shut it down and put in its place a new factory, right, that's not spewing cement dust, a new factory in when, which all of us can know and develop to our full potentials, unpoisoned. So the importance of this story is that the problem, even though the cement dust in our lungs can be problematic, the real problem and therefore the real solution is the system, the cement factory that's spewing the cement dust in the first place. And as long as we even conceptualize a problem as a problem of individuals, we will never solve it. So, okay, so that was in response to that 
Brittany, you're muted. Do you have something else to say? I was just saying that's a wonderful answer. I love that allegory. Thank you. I need to, I need to <laughs> put pictures with it now and all that. But, yes, okay. I would love to see a presentation on that next. <laughs> okay. So now, so we're rounding the bin and then we can just open it up for more uh, free flowing conversation. So what can we do today? I just gave you a framework for eight collective action teams. I'm glad that there was such interest in, in, in many of them, all of them. But today, going back to that image from the um, dual reality restaurant saga, first of all, we need to actively look for evidence of two-sided signs. We need to ask the question in our data or in, in, in just looking at, in, at the world, is there something differential going on here by race, by gender, by immigration status, by language status, by zip code, by part of the country, by urban, rural? Is there something differential going on here? We cannot feel satisfied just looking up and saying, well, it looks open to me. Wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. So we need to be unafraid to examine even our clinical data, even my you know, my data as a physician, I need to be unafraid to say, am I doing something differential in terms of my recommendations or the time spent or test ordered by any of these axes? We also need to burst through our bubbles to experience our common humanity. So we need to, all of us, first of all, is living in a bubble. Our bubbles are our jobs and our children and our communities, maybe a faith community, maybe a sorority or fraternity, you know, like, right. And some of our bubbles are quite big within soap bubble boundaries, but it's still a bubble. Some of our bubbles are smaller and with thicker plexiglass boundaries. And sometimes I wonder if we're even starting to tint those and polarize those so that we can't see in or out. But whatever the size of our bubbles is, most of us do not know in our bubble that just across town there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. So we need to find ways as individuals and ways for institutions to support this, to burst through our bubbles, to experience our common humanity in different settings. In that way, I think, and this is so important, especially in, in our kind of divided political nation, we need to get to know one another across politics, across town, across states. We need to really understand that we all have the same desires, we all have the same abilities, and, all, and that this, this divide that we have allowed the sign and the door and the lock to create, we need to burst through, that's why this image burst through our bubbles, to experience our common humanity in different circumstances. Then we need to be interested in the stories of others, to believe the stories of others, and then to join in the stories of others. And I'm so heartened that in, our, in these mobilizations um, that are, are around the, the continued police violence against communities, um, that more people have joined in, that, these, these, that the groups who are being mobilized are so buried. It's, it's like finally the people inside the restaurant heard what was being said on the outside that this restaurant is closed to me. They were interested in hearing it. They believed it, although it's taken us, you know, cell phone videos for 20 years or whatever to get people to believe, but now finally joining in. We need to develop a sensitivity to the absence of. So I charge any of us when, next time we're sitting at a decision-making table to take a good look around and ask who is not here, who has an interest in this proceeding. And then your job is not just to represent their interests, your job is to actually create space at the table, to find them a way to the table. So we need to ask who, who is not here at the table, what is not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that if put in place could be quite productive. And we need to reveal inaction in the face of need because um, although I didn't go deeply into it because I didn't share the gardener's tale, structural racism can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission, and very often shows up as inaction in the face of need. Because structural racism doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator, because it's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms, then then the system can be put in place and it's on autopilot and it's inaction in the face of need that allows the con con continuous inequity. 
But we also have to recognize that all of the action verbs are not only in the part of those who are inside the restaurant. So those of us on the outside need to know our power. We need to recognize that action is power and especially that collective action is power. So that's why I'm so glad that the Partnership for Southern Equity has convened all of us to be talking about these issues and others today. I, um, oh, I thought I was going to close, but I'm not. I am going to actually share one allegory. The reason I didn't realize I was going to share this one is because this is an allegory that I used to use a whole stage to walk across. And now I have a tiny little box. But let me try this one in my tiny little box. So this allegory, Life on a Conveyor Belt, Moving to Action, is actually... Um, not sparked, the image that I built this around is not sparked by something I saw with my own real eyes, but it's sparked by an image from the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, in which she tries, um, and well, she does, she describes to white readers that they can be participating in racism without doing anything actively racist. In fact, they could be passively participating in the system, which is just like, on a conveyor belt, just living their own lives, but moving constantly toward racism. I want to take her image and I want to expand on this image to talk about how we become actively anti-racist. So I am going to put us on a conveyor belt where, and I know I'm in a tiny little box, but we're just moving, we're just sending our kids to school, going to work on this conveyor belt. But, but those who are on top of the conveyor belt, some of us are being ground up by the conveyor belt, right? But those who are on top of the conveyor belt, who are living as white, are just doing this work, um, going to school, doing the artwork, whatever, moving inexorably through racism and toward racism. And there's even a big sign at the end, racism, 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 just blaring it. But we're so involved in our work that we don't even look up at the sign or we may look up and we go, oh, racism. And then we close our eyes. So maybe we're in denial or maybe we're doing our thing. And then we look up and we say racism <gasps> and we turn around, but we don't do anything else. So we just continue to drift backward on that conveyor belt. So maybe we're colorblind. My challenge to us right now is here we've been on this conveyor belt. Now we're looking up because I've been talking about racism all this time. Look, we say, oh, racism. Yes, we do need to turn around. But when we turn around, we also need to take a step and another step. And we need to start walking at least as fast as the conveyor belt is moving, walking backwards on this conveyor belt just to stay in the same place. And what happens when you are walking backwards on a crowded conveyor belt? You start bumping into people and it becomes uncomfortable for them and uncomfortable for you. And they're like, hey, buddy, watch out where you're going, which is your opportunity to do the first of three stages of being actively anti-racist, which is to name racism and say, do you see where we're going? Do you want to go there or will you turn with me? Well, most people don't want to be disturbed out of their comfort. So they might just say, well, just get out of my way. But maybe one or two will turn. So now you have two or three of you walking backwards on this conveyor belt and you keep bumping into people and you keep naming racism and inviting them to turn. And more and more will turn, never 50%, don't even hold your hard out for 50%. But now as you have more and more of you walking backwards on this conveyor belt, then you know, you're developing a critical mass. So now you don't even have to just stay in the same place. Now you can start making progress, not just away from the sign, but now where are you going? You're going to the motor that's running the conveyor belt. So now that you're at the motor, it's the time for the second stage of being actively anti-racist, which is to ask the question, how is racism operating here? Looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And I think it's this lever. So I'm going to grab the lever and I'm going to pull on it and the whole system starts shaking and I've done it. I've done it. Except racism is a very fancy system. So it reconfigures itself and it keeps on going, which talks about the importance of the third stage of being actively anti-racist, which is to organize and strategize to act. So as I'm pulling on the lever, I need you to push that button. I need you over there to pull on that pulley. I need you to swing that pendulum. Each of us needs to take a part of this system. And I do believe that working together, we can dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. This is our promise and our challenge in this moment. It's urgent. Thank you very much. And so now we're open for full discussion. I will stop sharing. And if there are other questions. So I couldn't even see myself. Was I in the box? Could you guys see me in the box walking and all that? I mean, could you? 
I can't hear you, Brittany. If you saw it, I saw your visual. <laughs> you can see it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> And so I encourage everyone to type questions in the chat box. And thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for an amazing presentation. Even though I've heard you speak several times, I've always learned something new and always love to hear your allegories on establishing, um, naming racism. So thank you so much for an amazing presentation as always. Thank you. Several people in the chat box just thanking you for an amazing presentation. Oh, thank you. One question that I have from one of our attendees your thoughts on white um, fragility by Robin DiAngelo. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Or her, it's a her. woman. Um, so I am familiar with her work. I haven't yet read the book because I'm just so busy, but I heard her speak once. Um, and I think it's important for her to be talking to white people and um, telling them that it's important to name racism. So, I mean, that's what I would say. I think that hers is an important voice. Ibram Kendi's is an important voice. There's so many of us in public health who have important voices. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of important work being done. And I guess I would say, if there's not another question right there, that um, white folks need to understand that their role in anti-racism is not that of an ally. That an ally is a little bit of a loose association in my mind, in my regard. Because if you're an ally, but now it's time for your summer vacation, you, meet, you might say, oh, well, okay, I'll check you in two weeks, hope the struggle goes well. Um, that we need to understand that even as racism unfairly disadvantages some and unfairly advantages others, it is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And that's the entry point for all of us to dismantle this system. If we have a collective consciousness, if, we, if our sense of uh, self-interest is not so narrowly defined, but we can understand that we want to be doing something for the good of all. And that, that's a problem. That whole notion of being a, a global citizen or being good you know, for the health of all, it's a challenge right now because of those seven targets that I, that I gave you. Um, so, so, but... So I want to just give you an example of um, an image that now it's so old, it's six years old, maybe you won't even remember what I'm talking about. But there was like this big story one day that there were these young teens, you know, 12, 13 year olds who were gonna celebrate one of their 13th birthday at a pool in one of their neighborhoods. So they went to the pool, the people who were at the pool objected to their being there, called the police. And the images that we saw was of a white police officer dragging this young black girl by her hair and then sitting on her. And we saw the young black boys, uh, 12, 13, with their hands handcuffed behind their back, sitting on the curb. And when I saw that, I was like, well, how did, how did we know this? And so people would say, well, it's social media. But I, I needed to know, how did we really know this? And I learned the next day when I saw this young white boy being interviewed on TV saying, it was almost as if I were invisible to the police. He was part of the friend group. He was part of the party. He saw what was happening to his friends. He could have run home to save himself, but instead recognizing that his white skin made him almost invisible to the police, he stood up there and videotaped all of what was happening to his friends. So white skin will not protect you from poverty. White skin will not protect you from homophobia. White skin will protect you from a lot of stuff, but it does give you white skin privilege in this country. If you are living as white, if people pass you on the street and they interpret you as white, you get the, uh, you know, the benefit of the doubt, you get uh, you know, higher expectations, you get safety, as that, young, as that white boy got, in so many other ways. And so instead of trying to say, I don't have white privilege, don't give me that and all, you have to recognize that you have white skin privilege and then use it. And the best way to use that you know, some people say, well, I don't know, you know, why am I going to go into that part of town? You know, I'm not really from there, you know, to be organizing around, you know, anti-racism. Well, don't go there. Go where you live. Organize around anti-racism at your board tables or in your neighborhood or in your, you know, community settings. I could tell a gazillion stories and it will not have the same impact of a white person saying to another person, why aren't we doing this? Or we should do that. Or what did you mean by that? So for white people to challenge racism in white spaces is really where the power is right now. So if you're, if you're looking for a role, yes, you can, we're all in this together. You can be in, in, in uh, solidarity. And certainly I think with the mobilizations, we need everybody out there, right? We've got urgent problems going on. 
But if you're trying to say, oh, but I don't really feel comfortable because I'm thinking, you know, because you're thinking you're doing it for those people or, you know, you're not doing it for those people. You're doing it for yourself and for the nation and the world. Answer. Another question that we have from the audience is how might we start walking backwards on the conveyor belt right now while we are also responding to COVID? Um, I think to read. Uh, so to read history. Um, I haven't yet read Isabel Wilkerson's new book, Cast, but you know, The Warmth of Other Suns was amazing. Uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow is amazing. Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy is amazing. As I said, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. I mean, there are lots of books. So Robin DiAngelo's book, um, uh, White Fragility, Ibram Kendi's books, uh, Stamped from the Beginning, and How to Be an Anti-Racist, and on and on and on. There, there's a, a lot to be read. Read the 1619 Project. Um, so we need to read uh, right now um, in I would say you could share either my TED talk, which was done 2014, it's, it's, it's rough. I, I felt so pressed for time in that. And so when I, I just happened to see it again yesterday because I was part of a group that was looking at it. And I was like, oh, you know, you, you see yourself. But anyway, everybody else loves my TED talk. So it has four allegories. So if you wanna share something with other people in your network, if you can even remember, hopefully, and share either the cement factory story or you can share the open close dual reality story with people. I mean, so start in conversation and start educating yourself. Get involved right now. The, 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 um, the biggest challenge right now is the effort to disenfranchise people in our nation around the boat. So definitely become in, uh, involved in getting people registered to vote, um, protecting votes, you know, nudging people that you know who you wonder if they're really gonna vote or not, especially young people, like reach out to young people. Yes, we need people standing in the streets. Yes, and people stand in the streets because they wanna say, count me in this number, I am here. But voting is another way of saying, count me in this number, I am here. So that we have to make sure, we have to push back all of the, all of the efforts to really disenfranchise the nation. Um, so voting is a big thing. Certainly the census, uh, Counting, if you haven't yet participated in the census, that's another way of saying, count me in this number. So we have to do that because then that has ramifications for everything. But so, so be, so educate yourself and then talk to others, become part of a collective. Don't try to do it on your own and recognize the state of our nation right now and how our democracy is trying to be undermined by limiting the votes of some of us and, and that can't stand. Yes. Another question we have is, in the face of continued backlash and denial from the left, how do you stay motivated and optimistic? From the left? I guess, I, I guess. Um, oh, just read it again so I can understand. Okay, yeah. In the face of the continued backlash and denial from the left, how do you stay motivated and optimistic? So I don't understand the from the left piece, uh, unless it's a different reference. But um, how do I stay optimistic? Because I value our children. Because I recognize there's not a such thing as my children and your children, but that all the children are our children. And I am trying to make this a better place for our children. It's because I value the genius in all of our children. And it makes me so happy when I see that genius flower. And it makes me so sad when I see that genius interrupted. Um, so really it's about, I love the children. Yeah. Another question we have is a reading list that you recommend to black women in public health. I know you discussed several different books um, that you recommend us reading, but um, is there another reading list that you recommend? So I have to say that unfortunately I'm so busy working that I'm not as well read as I should be. Um, so, so that's going to limit the, the books that I recommend in a reading list. So I gave you those others before. Um, what have I read recently that I've really liked? I don't know. We also have to keep our sanity. So we need to, to read the, the history and the politics stuff and the framing stuff, but we also need to read joyful things. Um, so I would put cast. I would say, you know, support our sister Isabel Wilkerson with cast. I hear it's great. It's um, the book for the book club in which I'm 
in which I am, but I haven't read it yet. So I'll be reading it very soon. So then I can give you a real opinion on it. Okay, thank you. How do we name internalized racism? There are many people of color who subscribe to racism. Yeah, so, um, and, and the internalized racism, part of it, it, it manifests in many different ways now. So some of it is devaluing people who look like us, even using the N word, you know, saying, oh, well, we can use that because we've redefined it. Nah, I don't subscribe to that at all. But, you know, um, what we do with our hair or skin lightening, not just in the US, but around the world on the African continent and the Indian subcontinent, you know, there's like all of this, this, this image of, of white beauty as, as beauty. Uh, so it manifests in a lot of ways, but what is really manifesting now for some is denial of racism, you know, that, that being sucked into that racism denial um, and feeling that I made it, therefore racism doesn't exist. And yes, so again, I wish I, you know, I haven't told the Gartner's tale, but, and I'm not going to go it right now because I, I just go very deep into it, but, but yes, there will be in the rich fertile soil, the strong seed makes it to a, a you know, a nice vigorous height, but even the weak seed in the, uh, the weak red seed in the rich fertile soil makes it halfway up. In the poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies so, and the strong pink seed just has to struggle to make it to a middling height. And so, um, yes, there will be some pink seed that make it to different heights. But the, the thing is, we're wasting so much other seed. If we just change the soil, then we could have more of us making it. And uh, instead of exceptionalizing some people, some people of color, or saying, well, this is proof positive that racism doesn't exist, we need to actually examine the differences in the quality of the soil. Look at the neighborhoods where people are, look at the investments, look at the differences in wealth, which are basis, when you look at between black and white folks, it's based on the fact that for centuries, there was coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country in which other people, white people, built wealth off of our unpaid labor. When you think of American Indian people, indigenous people, this land used to all be theirs. And now they're constrained to lands where sometimes, you know, in Navajo country, um, their whole, they're restricted to like, you know, canned foods and stuff like that, that they can bring in. And, and as I was driving through, I was like, but look at all of this land. But the land is where the uranium was mined. And so now it's a sacrifice zone. And there are real parts of the country where real people are living, which are deemed sacrifice zones out there, as well as in our cities, where communities are just abutting known pollut polluting industries. So um, all of that is to say that when we, uh, that we have to recognize that the soil is different and that if we really want to um that we have to acknowledge that and we have to acknowledge why it's different it didn't just so happen that way in the red didn't create their rich soil in fact a lot of the the pink flowers that were killed maybe um, were put over to enrich the rich fertile soil in which the red seed were planted i mean there's so many interactions there so what we have to understand are those four things that racism exists, that racism is a system, that racism saps the strength of the whole society and that we can do something about it. And because the cement dust is in all of our lungs, it can affect, affect all of us differently. And just because your skin color is a certain way doesn't mean that you don't have cement dust in your lungs. Usually when your skin color is a certain way, it, 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 turns, it is internalized racism. That's how it impacts us. Thank you. Another suggestion from one of our audience in reference to the books is Bell Hooks Rock My Soul. Um, it was just talking about one of the books. Another question that we have from the audience, what is one action we can take to advance health equity in our community engagement? Involve people who are doing the work already. So um, I really think that who's at the table and who's not is the most important of the different elements of decision-making, which I describe as the mechanisms of structural racism, you know, the how is racism operating here. So if you're about to engage on something, you know, people are always trying to solve the, their own problems in communities. So what we can do is link with those people who are already doing that work, uh, invest in them, bring them to our decision-making tables, recognize that we do not have all the knowledge we need at our decision-making table because everybody has something to learn, everybody has something to teach. We should always be in a learning stance 
And often when people diversify, for example, their boards of directors, they think, oh, we're, we're going to let this person come here and be here, but they don't really expect to learn anything from them or get anything from them. So kind of lose that. And then if you get the one and they were part of the board and then you're like, oh, wow, she really brought something great. Then that person becomes the black board member or the Latinx, you know, Latina board member or whatever for all the other boards now that they become unknown. It is scary to open up your process to somebody you don't know. But if we understand that everybody has something to teach us, right? And that all of us have something to learn, it becomes less scary. So to engage in ways of power sharing with communities, especially because communities are already trying to solve their own problems. Thank you. And we have a suggestion from the audience. Another great book is Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God by Kelly Brown Douglas. And another great author is Dorothy Roberts. So I, you know, she's written a number of books. So um, any of the books by Dorothy Roberts would also be pretty good. Thank you, Dr. Jones. We do not have any more questions from the audience, but I, again, thank you so much for a powerful presentation. And my biggest takeaway from your presentation is to challenge, for the challenge for me to create space at the table and ask myself um, what is not on the agenda. So I really appreciate your powerful presentation as always. <laughs> thank you. I don't thank know if you, you have any other- Insights, oh, I could talk for a long time. <laughs> I'm, wondering, I'm wondering whether um, Arlene, Parker Golson has anything that she would like to ask or contribute or on um, Andrea or Kia or Dr. C.T. Stafford or anybody else who's on this side of the room and can be seen. Do you all have any questions you wanted to ask me or anything you wanted to interject because we have uh, nine more scheduled minutes and we don't have to go to that, but is there any, anything else? Looks like another question popped up in q and I'm not opening it, but is there another one? Um, someone just said, amazing. Thank you for, thank you so much for presenting. I hope that we can all. And Arlene said she doesn't have any questions. Her, that was her last question about. And I think that if, um, if we can understand that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources, but especially right now in how it's dividing us as a nation and understand that we are not our enemy, that we, we all, that we need to come together and value all of us and create an, uh, a setting, a country in which all of us can know our full potentials and then have the opportunity to develop in that full potentials. We will all win. Don't frame this as a we versus they argument. Don't frame this, at, you know, using the false idea, this myth of a zero sum game. If we come together to work, we will have a much bigger pie and it will be a tastier pie and happier pie and there'll be more than enough for all of us. So um, I'm so afraid for the, um, for the divide in this nation and I hope we can get past this as a democracy. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And before we adjourn, I have a couple announcements. First, I would encourage you guys to register for Partnership of Southern Equity Just Energy Summit. It will kick off on Monday, the 28th at 4 p.m. There will be daily sessions held on the 29th through the 1st at 9 a.m. And our call of action will be at 12 p.m. on the 2nd of October. Also, I encourage you guys to register for Archie's um, Policy, Health, and Community Revitalization, which will be held on the 6th of October from 2 to 3.30 p.m. They will have Shirley Franklin, the former mayor of Atlanta, and also the executive board chair of Purpose Built Communities, along with David Edwards, who is the former CEO of Purpose Built Communities. Archie will also have the State of COVID events, which will be held on October 7th from 10 to 11 a.m. Dr. Ford, who is the district director for DeKalb Board of Health, along with Lisa Again, the Director of Community Health Services and Partnerships of Fulton Board Health will be on the panel. I also encourage you guys, as Dr. Jones mentioned, to vote on this upcoming election. This is a huge election, and I encourage you to either request your absentee ballot to vote by mail or vote in person, whichever one you feel comfortable. And thank you all for attending Partnership for Southern Equities event.